Boyten and other colleagues may know, I prefer to talk a talk where there are epsilons and deltas and lower bounds and upper bounds. But here, Wojtek asked me to talk about something else, where probably there will be few epsilons and deltas and more philosophy about the um, research in an industrial research lab. And if I convince you, then let me know, because then I can use it with my managers. <laughs> um, so this will be about information theory in an industrial research lab. And I won't assume any, any knowledge of information theory. We will, everything we will go through will be quite elementary. And so let me say, well, information theory, which was introduced by Shannon in 1948, if I had to summarize it in three words, I would say it's all about models, bounds, and algorithms. So you model data, you, you, sh you prove fundamental bounds on what is the best you can do, and you work on algorithms to for, to for achieving these bounds. So what is the mathematical theory? There are measures of information, and this is about the models. There are fundamentals of, bet of data representation, codes for compactness, this is data compression, and for secure and reliable communication, this is error correcting codes, and some aspects of cryptography. I won't claim that information theory actually addresses cryptography, it addresses some aspects of cryptography. Yeah. And more generally, I would say that what information theory provides is a formal framework for areas of engineering and science for which the notion of information is relevant. So it's, the, it's what was also novel, although, although Shannon was targeting a very specific problem, which was, was the one of digital communication, what was novel about his approach is the fact of, of looking at problems from a formal framework looking at practical problems in a formal framework. And I think that that's the main contribution of Shannon to science. So what are the components? What we work with, we work with data models, with fundamental bounds, and with codes, and with efficient encoding and decoding algorithms. And the engineering problems that are addressed are data compression, error control coding, cryptography. And these are enabling technologies with many practical applications. I don't have to tell you. you you l go through them in your everyday life. So what do we do? And I'm taking our group in HP Labs, could be any information theory research group in any uh, big company. So I took from the mission of our group and say, well, research the mathematical foundations and practical applications of information theory generating intellectual property and technology for some company through the advancement of scientific knowledge in these areas. So the first question here is, OK, applying the theory, as you, say, as you saw, if this company needs to do data compression. This company needs to do error, correct, error correction. So it makes sense to apply the theory. The company, you, you enable the products in this way. It's not so clear why the company needs to invest on advancing the theory. Right? So you apply the theory to create these algorithms. It's not that clear why you have to advance the theory. So there are many answers to that. There are some of the typical answers that you hear many times about basic research, which you say, well, it's a long-term long investment. It gives you prestige. It gives you visibility. And then you give back to society. In fact, our lab, uh, the Advanced Studies Lab at HP Labs, was founded up when David Packard was still uh, in life, he said, we need to give back to society something and do research for advancement of science. That's not very convincing, convincing to upper management. So uh, I'll tell you, uh, my, my claim is that investing in advancing the theory makes the difference between a differentiating technology and an enabling technology. So I'm saying all these data compression, error correction, these are all enabling technologies. But you could say, if you're a system in integrator, you could say, well, I take them off the shelf. I'm sure I will need all of these things. I'll take them off the shelf when I need them. 
I claim that by doing that, you, you may enable your technology. You won't differentiate it from the competition, because everyone can take it off the shelf. So my main claim in this talk will be that working on the theory helps developing analytical tools that are needed to envision innovative technology differentiating ideas. And so I'll do it through four case studies. Probably I won't be able to go through all of them. I will go through two, two and a half case studies. Two of them are, I will talk about them as a researcher since I was part of them, of working on them. The other two will be more as a manager because this is work done in my group in which I'm not part as a researcher. So the first one is about image compression. This is our work about eight years ago, on 90, 10 years ago, on JPEG-LS, which is the standard for lossless image compression. So there, what we will show is how, from doing completely theoretical research on universal context modeling, and we will explain in the talk what, what this is, we got to working for a lossless image compression standard, participating in standardization committees and things like that, that have absolutely nothing to do with writing papers on universal coding. The second one will be DUDE, which is discrete, this an acronym for discrete universal denoiser. So this is our more recent work on denoising. And here I will show how to go from a formal setting for universal denoising, that was a formal paper, an information theoretic paper, applied to actually doing image denoising. The third one is about using error correcting codes in nanotechnology. These things seem completely unrelated. You will see where the relation is. I will, I will show that. And here I will show what are the advantages of our interdisciplinary research. So we have a group of people of, 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 of physicists and chemists in our lab working on nanotechnology. And they realized they needed something. And they had the expertise there with coding theorists. That this is one case in which taking the, co the, the coding algorithm off the shelf wouldn't have worked. And this is another more futuristic work on two-dimensional information theory, more, ex more specifically two-dimensional constraint coding, and how they, it may impact in the fact, in, in the future, the, the um, efficiency of storage devices. So just briefly, let me go very briefly through how we work, uh, what I would call our work paradigm. So we start very much like you do in the academia. So we start with identifying a fairly abstract practical problem. Practical because, well, information theory in general it is practical. I mean, there are the, it, it, it's very easy to justify practicality in information theory, right? So we start from there. For example, we say we'll work on image compression. We'll work on two-dimensional channel coding. We'll work on denoising. And the motivation usually could be scientific interest, interest or vision of vision of, of benefit to XXX is the company, to some company, the company in which we are working. So this means, this, this probably will limit, the, this is a difference with the academia, in the sense we won't take any, any, any product, any, any problem. We will probably take problems for which we see that there is relevance to the company. So we will work on the theory. This is pretty much academic research. But on, on, in parallel, we will start working on practical solutions. Here we will work, for example, on developing lower bounds. So what is the best you can do? And here we will work on algorithms that are probably far away from these bounds, but may, in the short term, serve the company. And there is, a, an, an, there is here feedback, in the sense that working on, the, on one helps you in the other. So the practical solutions, they for, for, of course, they help the company. The, the product is patents, technology, consulting for the business units. But on the other hand, in parallel, we work on the theory. And that we feed the, the, the academic community with uh, papers, participation in conferences. And then the nice thing is that all these things come together. 
Because, first of all, without visibility in the academic community, you won't have access to talent. So the students, if the students don't know about HP Labs, it's very unlikely they will choose to go to HP Labs, right? And the visibility working on the theory also has an impact on HP in this case, in, in any company, in this case on HP. And I give you, when I work on, on when I show you the work on image compression, I'll, I'll show you an example of that. And then you, if you work in practical solutions, you can impact standards and having a, 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 a prevalent a position in the standards, again, can have a positive impact to uh, the company. And again, the important thing, and that's an advantage of working in a research lab as compared to the academia, we have this feedback here. Working in, the company, in a company gives you new challenges and very good ideas for identifying interesting problems. And that's an, a, a big advantage. Because we, we usually are able to find interesting problems which are not just made up. So let me start. I will go through a few slides with very ba basic ideas about universal modeling and coding to introduce uh, the, the image compression and image denoising problems. So what is universal modeling? Let's say start with uh, the traditional Shannon theory. So traditional Shannon theory assumes that you have a probabilistic model of the data. So you have data, you have to do things with this data, for example, compress it. And it assumes that you have a probabilistic model of it and aims at compressing the data optimally with respect to the model. Now, what, are, what is the relation with the, between codes and model? First of all, it's given by this very basic inequality that you learn in the first week in an information theory course, this graphs inequality, which, tell, which basically tells you if you give me any code that, that can be decoded, then the length, if you have a string, here we have a string that will be notation we will use uh, through the talk, you have a string of length n over a finite alphabet a. So if you give me a code with a certain length, then not all the code words can be short because this number here, if you look at all the strings in the alphabet, all the n tuples, this sum cannot be too large, which means that not all these numbers can be short. Okay, so you cannot compress as much as you want. This gives you the limit of how much you can compress. But if this is the case, this is the same of a distribution. So a distribution, when, when you create a probability distribution on n tuples, it also has to have this property. This means that you can, a code defines a probability distribution this way. Okay? And conversely, you can see, you can, you can, you can show that if you have a probability distribution, then there exists a code that assigns about minus log the probability of each string symbols to that to each a string. Okay? So this means that a probability distribution serves as a model to encode a string and on re, uh, conversely every code has an associated model. So a model is a probabilistic tool to understand and predict the behavior of the data. That's the take home conclusion here. Okay? That's when we discuss models, that's what it means for us. So, when you give me a model, then there is a tool which is called arithmetic coding invented around in the 70s, 30, around seven, 30 years ago, which gives you the possibility not just to assign a code word of length about log of one over the probability to each string, but also to do it efficiently and sequentially. So you don't need to look at all the, all the string. As you see the string, you assign a code word. And if you have this string of legs n, given by x1, x2, xn, then the what we call the ideal code length for the symbol xt is this, uh, sorry, there is a typo here, is minus log of this probability. Okay? So, and, and moreover, the model can vary arbitrarily and adapt to the data. 
So you don't have to give me the model of, uh, initially. You can learn the model from the data. So the conclusion is that a coding system is a model and a coding unit. So we have to model the data, and then we can use, for example, an arithmetic code to encode the data based on that model. So we have two separate problems here, the design of a model and using the model to encode. The second part is less interesting nowadays because lots of research has been going on, and, and, and this, this problem is considered to be pretty much nailed down. However, as you have new type of data, this is a problem that can never be, the modeling problem is a problem that can never be nailed down. Because as you have new types of data, there are new things to investigate. So we view data compression as a problem of assigning probabilities to data. That's what data compression is. So it's a modeling problem, basically. Now, what universal data compression is about, you say, well, universal data compression deals with the optimal description of data in the absence of a given model. So in practice, nobody, when I have to compress an image, nobody's giving me a, no, a model of the, of the image. It's not a geniated compression scheme where a genie told me how the image was created, right? I have to create the model myself. So there, if, I, if I'm creating the model myself, then what is, this what is this concept of optimality? How is it meaningful? Because, OK, if I have data, one string to compress, one image, I can always say, well, the best model is the one that, uh, uh, that assigns the whole probability, probability one, to that image. So one bit to that image and zero to the other. OK, so the problem in this sense is ill-posed. So the answer to this is the, the concept of model classes. What is model classes? So a universal code is one to perform as well as the best model in a given class of models for any string where the best competing model changes from string to string. So as I'm given new strings, my universal code needs to compress as well as the best model in the class, not the best model in general, because the, mes the best model in general would assign only one bit to that string. But the best model in the class, so I want to be as good as the best model in the class specifically designed for that string. So that's a universal data compression. So I, I want to emphasize that universality makes sense only with respect to a model class. So a, a code that assigns lengths L to an n-tuple is, is said to be pointwise universal with respect to a C given class C if asymptotically, so when the length of the data goes to infinity, the, what we call the redundancy, which is the normalized difference between the code lengths it achieves and the code lengths achieved for that sequence by the best code, by the best model in the class, tends to zero for every sequence. Okay? And the question here is, how fast can you go to zero? And there we will start going into modeling problems. So one thing, important thing here is that universal coding tells us how to encode optimally with respect to a class. It doesn't tell us how to choose the class. So choosing the class is really an art. So when I design a code which is universal for some class and I'm seeing an image, well, what is the model class there? Choosing it, there is no, sci there, there is no science. There is no way I can solve the problem of choosing the best model, okay? the, model the best model class. Okay? That's an art. And some possible criteria for choosing a model, first of all, complexity. So are, is there a model class for which there exist efficient algorithms? And the second one, which will be the underlying theme in universal compre and compression and denoising, is prior knowledge on the data. What do you know about your data? So we will see, and in the next slide, that the bigger the model class, the slower the best possible convergence of the redundancy to zero. So I, I showed before that universal, universal data compression algorithms will make this redundancy tends to zero. How fast? Well, how fast depends on how many, how rich 
your model class is. And you don't want it, you do, don't want to make it too rich, because then the conversion to zero is very slow. And to give you an example, if you are familiar with the lempel zip algorithm, okay, gzip, if you take an image and you, you want to losslessly compress it, and you apply gzip to it, you won't be able to compress. It will compress very, very little. That's a, a universal, a generic universal algorithm that is asymptotically optimal, but asymptotically is the key word there. No, Im, no practical image is compressed in general by gzip. Okay? And that because it doesn't use any prior knowledge on images. Okay, so finally, I will introduce the concept of what is a parametric model class. So, I'm, I'm, so I, I said what is a model class, it's a class of models. A parametric one is one in which we have a distribution which is parameterized with some parameter. And a typical example will be, for example, you take a Bernoulli class, where you have a Bernoulli distribution with one parameter. Okay, or more generally, uh, a distribution over an alphabet of size alpha. So where you have alpha minus one parameters. Or you may have states. You have a finite automaton with a distribution at each, each state. You have k states, alpha minus one parameters per state. Another example that it's important in image compression is a memoryless geometric distribution on the integers. So you have a distribution on the integers where you have a, a geometrically decaying probability for each integer. So here you have a, a distribution in which you have an infinite alphabet, the integers, but, or here I'm, I'm taking the non-negative integers, and only one parameter, which is the decay. Okay? And a, a straightforward method to, co to compress was already designed in 84 by Reason, and by the way, Reason is the father of all this modeling and coding separation and the theory of universal modeling. And the first idea, the trivial idea for encoding with a parametric model class is you look at the data in two passes. In the first pass, you go through all possible models and you find the best the, uh, that is adapted to that data, okay? The one that would compress best to this data. So you encode the model. It, this is what is called the model cost. And then you compress the data with respect to that model. So you have two parts. This one, the more parameters you have, the more it costs to encode the data. There is a trade-off. The more parameters you have, the more expensive it is to encode the best parameter, right? But on the other hand, the more parameters you have, the best you can fit your data. So the probability will be higher, and then the code length will be smaller. So there is a trade-off. The dimension of the parameters plays, plays a fundamental role in modelless problems. That's, again, the take-home conclusion. You don't want to over-parameterize your data. So you can, there is a lower bound, there is a fundamental lower bound, which if you know the entropy bound in, in, in traditional Shannon theory, then there is a generalization by reasoning of that for universal modeling, which tells you you can co converge in a universal code. With a universal code, you can converge to the entropy at some speed. And the speed depends on the number of parameters. The more parameters you have, the, s the slower will be your convergence to the entropy, to the best you can do. Okay? So this, is, this formalizes what I said before that the more parameters you have, the more difficult it is to convert to the optimum. But on the other hand, the optimum is better. But if you assume it is fine. Yeah? If you assume it is fine. Yes, 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 yes. I'm assuming here, assuming here the, 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 the easiest setting. Of, I'm, not very, I'm not being very formal or also. Okay? So the conclusion is that the number of parameters affects the achievable conversions rate of a universal code length to the entropy. Finally, I will talk a little bit about models. What type of models? And, and the one reason I'm doing that is that, that this was, going back to the story about the image compression standard, this was what we were working on when the call for image compression standards came. So at HP Labs, we were working, doing theoretical work 
that I had been doing all during the 90s about context models and tree models. So what is uh, a context model is a, or a tree model is a more efficient parameterization of a Markov process. So in a Markov process, when you look at data, say you, are, say you have binary data, you are looking the next input is a one, so you look at the past, which we call the context, say of length four, to model the data, to give a probability to the data. The problem is that many times in practical data, the length of the context you have to look at, I mean, if, if you look at a context of a fixed length, then the number of parameters grows exponentially with the size of the memory. That's not good to say that we don't want too many parameters. But many times in modeling problems, you don't have to look at exactly the same number of bits behind, I mean, to the, into the past, regardless of where in the, you are in the data. Sometimes it's when you have seen, for example, 0, 1, 0, 0, you have to stop here. And in other cases, you have to look more to model your data. So this you can formalize with a tree. You say you have a tree which gives you the past, gives you access to the whole past. And say here, this red gives you the current past, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and you get to a state. So the leaves of the trees give you the state in which you are. So for a Markov model, this tree has all the same, all the leaves have the same depth. But more generally, it could be, a, could be a very skewed tree in which sometimes you look a lot into the past and sometimes you look only a little bit. Okay, this is what we call um, tree models. And what we showed in many papers, and I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm citing here, I'm overciting my own con or our group's contribution because I'm, I'm showing the, the work we have been doing and how then we turned into practical. There are, I'm only mentioning one work, which is not ours, because this, is a, this got a best paper award from the Information Theory Society, the work on CTW. And um, so what we show is that there exist efficient universal schemes in the class of three models of any size. So you, you don't, not only you don't need to give me the probabilities, I will model them myself, you don't need to give me the tree. I will find efficiently what is the best tree for that data. And this implies also algorithmic, uh, algorithmic uh, type of work, for example, working with suffix trees, tries, and things, all the, all the kind of things that Wojtek loves. So now let's get to image compression. So some applications of lossless image compression. So images meant for further analysis and processing. So as opposed to just human perception, for example, medical imaging in deep space communication. Images were lost might have legal implications. Again, medical imaging. Images obtained at great cost. Typically, for example, if you send uh, an, uh, uh, an exploration rover to Mars, you don't want to, to lose your data or, and, and encode it with loss. Right? But, okay, I, I forgot to say something. Most of the image compression that you see, your JPEGs are lossy compression. So you don't recover your data exactly. Here we are talking about lossless compression in which after decoding, you get back your data exactly. Okay? And applications with intensive editing and repeated compression, the compression cycles. Sometimes you have the data, you compress it, you decompress it, you compress it again. If you do it with a JPEG, you destroy the data. So that's why you use lossless image compression. And in the 90s, there was a call from the JPEG committee. It's an international uh, committee for standardization. There was a call for a lossless image compression standard. And at the time, we were at the t working on the application of our ideas to lossless image compression. So again, let me go back to this uh, universality versus prior knowledge thing. So. We started, uh, when we were working on three models, we applied these three models to images, and they, were, they failed miserably. And the reason they failed miserably is similar to what I said, the reason I said that the lempel z algorithm will fail when you use gzip on an image, it will fail. Is that it doesn't use prior knowledge 
or some structural symmetries typical to images. So a universal model has an associated learning cost. That's something we discussed in the first part of this talk. And the, the question is, why learn something that we already know? That's the main thing you have to, to the, the, main, the main idea in all these modeling problems. Don't learn something that you already know. So you know that images tend to be, for example, a, 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 a mixture of smooth areas and edges. So don't learn that. Try to use the idea, the, your knowledge on that. So I won't go through the details of uh, this, uh, uh, what is the prior knowledge you have on images. But the main idea here was to apply our universal algorithms, but taking into account prior knowledge in the images, especially the fact that if you uh, prediction error, so if you have to compress a pixel, you can predict it from what you already have, or what the part of the image that your decoder already decoded. So predict a value and compress the difference between this value and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the difference between the, the pixel you have to encode and this predicted value, which is already available to the decoder. And this, this, this uh, the distribution of this tend to be Laplacian. So you have to be universal in this class, in the class of Laplacian models. Okay. So in practice, you don't use this long context. What you use is some causal template around the pixel you have to. So if, for example, you have to encode this pixel. You look, the context is given by some surrounding pixels. And um, again, as I said, if you predict this value from some surrounding neighborhood, the prediction error tends to behave this way, what we call a two-sided geometric distribution. And actually, there is some work we did on what are the optimal codes for this distribution. And, and again, this is information theoretic in the sense that we characterize exactly what are the best codes. It's not that we use these codes in the image compression standard, but it guided our choice of codes in the image compression standard. So the one thing that we saw that was important here is the complexity constraint. And the question we asked was, are sophisticated models worth the price in complexity? So all the, uh, these algorithms, I mean, when, you, and when I say complexity, I'm not saying complexity in terms of complexity theory. All these algorithms, algorithm context, which is the one we worked on, or this CT, CTW, they are linear time algorithms. So you cannot do simpler than that. But in practice, they are very heavy. They are linear time with very big constants. And even arithmetic coding is something that a practitioner, at least at that time, in the mid-90s, wouldn't buy easily. So, and the question we ask is high complexity required to approach the best possible compression. So the idea in JPEG LS was to apply judi judicious modeling to reduce the complexity rather than to improve compression. So we saw that improving compression was something very difficult. We were close to the, what can be achieved in lossless image compression. But we saw that we using modeling ideas, we could achieve that with much less complexity. And that's what, in the end, paid off. So the modeling, the reason is that the modeling coding separation that I started talking about at the beginning of the talk is this paradigm is less neat without complex models or arithmetic coding. Okay? So I won't go through the details of what is this loco i algorithm, which is the based, I mean, JPEGLS is based on this loco i algorithm, which we developed in the late 90s. I'll tell you before. Yeah, before I finish with this subject, when I tell you the, so you can say, well, wh how is, how defining a, a compression standard helps the company? Because, oh, something I need to tell you is that the JPEG, the JPEG committee, which is different from MPEG, for example, ma makes quite a lot of, of, of emphasis in the fact that the standard should be royalty free. So HP doesn't get any royalty from people using this standard. 
So one, one direct answer is that, well, we started using this compression scheme in our printers, and probably we knew it better than anyone else. So this is the direct answer of how, why this is useful. But there is a more subtle answer. And later, a few years later, I started working with some, some, di some business unit doing remote workstations, in which they have to compress the, 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 the buffer in order to send it remotely. And I transferred some to them, some image compression technology, which was based similar to that, but not basically that. At the same time, uh, NASA took this algorithm and use it to compress the images from Mars, from the Mars Exploration Rover. It was around the same time. So later I found out that this uh, business unit, the marketing guys there, the way they were marketing they, they, their workstations was by saying that the differentiated technology there is the image compression done by the same guys who send the images from, <laughs> from Mars. So these are things that are when, when the industry they tell a return on investment, these are it's, it's very difficult to measure, right? But everyone understands that this type of visibility or prestige gives something to the company. Okay. So let me now switch gears and start talking about denoising. But every, everything that we went through this, this modeling uh, introduction will be useful also here about denoising. So denoising, what is the denoising problem? So you have a source of data, the, a sequence of lengths n. It goes through some discrete memoryless channel. We will assume that the channel is memoryless. So a channel that introduces some noise to the data. And what you see instead of the C, instead of the X sequence, you see the Z sequence, which is the X sequence corrupted by noise. And the denoiser tries to, to, to find some denoised version of the Z sequence that approaches the X sequence in some way. So the goal is when you observe the Z sequence, you want to choose the X hat to optimize some fidelity criterion. For example, minimize the number of symbol errors. For example, if, it's, if it, this is a binary data, then you can take the Hamming distance. So how many symbols are different between X hat and X? Okay. Or you can think of the square distance if it's more continuous data. Okay? And this is a natural extension of the work on prediction because you want to predict your data, but also you have access to the, to the noisy data. To the, not only you have access to the past and to the future in this case, because it's not a causal problem. So you have access to the, to the, to the neighboring data, to the context. You have, but the data is noisy. But not only that, you have access even to your own data point, but noisy. Okay. So applications, image and video denoise. You, you, you will see. We will talk mostly about image denoise, and I'll show you a demo. Okay. And there are other applications: financial data denoise, DNA sequence analysis, and so forth. And we have worked on all of these. So what is the DUD algorithm? is a, a denoising scheme that is universal. And here, the meaning of the word universal is similar to what I said in universal compression. So it has no prior knowledge or assumption on what type of mechanism generating the data. So the problem of denoising, when you know the mechanism which generates the data and you know your channel statistics, then it's typical Bayesian inf inference. It's very easy. To find you, you apply a base rule and you get quite easily what is the best denoised uh, version of the data. What happens when you don't have access, as is the case in practice, to a model of the data? So the, our algorithm is universal. It is asymptotically optimal in the same sense as in data compression. It, in some well defined mathematical sense, it does as well as if you knew the distribution in advance, okay? like in data compression. So you don't know the distribution, but what I'm saying is that even if you, knew, if you had full knowledge of the statistics of x, you couldn't do any better asymptotically. 
And it's practical in the sense that it's low complexity. It's linear complex, not, not just it's linear, but you can do, you can apply it very efficiently, and we, you will see now. So the theoretical impact of the work was a universal, is to show that universal denoising is possible. So it's not just a universal denoising algorithm. First, we showed that it's, it is possible. In principle, you could say that it's not possible to do as well as the best denoiser if you don't have access to the statistics of the data. So we, we showed that it is possible and that it can be done in linear time. And that work got the 2006 Communication Society and Information Theory Society based Best Paper Award. So let's say that in, in an industrial uh, research lab, typically you wouldn't stop at the theoretical impact. You need to show some practical impact. But here, say, if you get a Best Paper Award, you can say, well, you have enough visibility and prestige that you can stop there. But you don't get Best Paper Awards very often. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so the practical impact is that you have, we have over 20 patents filed and granted on these uh, applications of this work. And this is joint work between our group and colleagues in the, in, in the academia, Sergio Verdu from Princeton, Zahi Weisman from Stanford, who, who at the time when we started working on that, who, he was a postdoc in our group. So first, let me go through how we do the denoising. So basically, what we have is a data sequence, a noisy channel. We have access to the uh, noisy data. And let me show you a two-dimensional version of it, So because we will apply it to image denoising. You have to denoise this pixel. And what we have is access to the surrounding, to the neighborhood, also the noisy data. So this is the sample you are denoising that, and these are the context samples. In one pass, you gather statistics about symbol occurrences per context pattern. So you tell me how many times, or what is the probability of getting a value of z given a noisy context. And then, that's where you use the Bayesian type of reasoning. You, from that, you can estimate the noise the noiseless symbol distribution given the, the context pattern. So I want to estimate the probability of xi given this noisy pattern. And the second pass, based on that estimate, you denoise each symbol based on the estimated posterior. So you, here in this pass, you estimate this posterior distribution. And here you de there is a, a closed form expression telling you how, how you should denoise based on this posterior. And I'm not going to go through here through the exact formula how you do it. But the intuition is who do you believe? What you see or what the global statistics tell you? You're looking at the context, and the context is all white, say. But the pixel you see here is black. So how do you, who do you believe? Maybe this black is because there is noise, and it should also be white. Or, but at some point, you have also to believe what you're seeing. It depends on how much noise you have. So how do you trade off these two, th these two infor types of information? That's what the algorithm solves, optimally. And in order to do that, again, it's important to model the data. And modeling the data means, in this case, also find the size of this context template. So how much context do you look at? So let me show you here an application. This is uh, for salt and pepper noise. So salt and pepper noise is noise that uh, this is a black and white. So black, this is a, a grayscale image. And you corrupt randomly. In this case, it's, I think, 30% of the pixels with either black or white. OK, so that's the salt and pepper channel. And this is the denoised version. Uh, you measure how good it is in terms of dBs. And it's like 3 dBs better than the one, the best one we had in the, the worst in the literature at, up to now. OK, so we have the best results there. But let me show you the, this demo before going through the demo. So this is 70% noise. Now, how we do it? It's not just applying the dude algorithm, the denoiser. What we do is we first apply it. After applying it, 
you created a, a, a denoised version of the image. You used this denoised version to create new context. So you cleaned up the context and you denoise again. So it's not that you are iteratively using it. It's not that you, you denoise and you denoise again. No. You denoise, you use the denoised version to create new context, and you denoise the original data again, but with, the new, with this cleaned up context, and so forth. So here I'm going to show you about 100 iterations of that algorithm. And the, we start with 70% noise in LENA. So only 30% of the pixels are available. Okay. Oops. Right. No. No. You know what? Let me. I don't know how to. How to love. Oh, no, no, I have to click on it. Yeah, that's it. So you, here you have the number of iterations and how the DBs, the, the PSNR, is improving. So in the end, we get to 31 DBs. It's pretty amazing the fact that, that you can get to that from only 30% of the pixels, right? Although once, I mean, it's amazing for a demo, but once you think of it, you say, well, you have a compressed version of LENA with JPEG. You compress it, say, 8 to 1, right? And it looks almost natural. And even there, you compressed it 8 to 1. So it's like having 12% of, of the information there. So what are the key, the main challenges in image denoising? So to get to this, to this uh, kind of, of um, performance, it's not just applying the dude directly. If you apply the dude directly the way we did it, we, we, we proved its, its optimality, you get nothing. And the reason is exactly the same reason as in image compression. You have a model, you have a model, you have to learn a model, and asymptotically you do as well as the best, but the asymptotics is in infinity and the image is finite. So again, you have to apply the same type of modeling ideas what, that we did in image compression. And the key component here is to model the conditional distribution of, so as I said, you need to learn the distribution of the pixel given the noisy environment. And the main issue is, again, that you have a large number of model parameters and a high learning cost. So how you uh, overcome this problem, and again, we leverage from the same universal approach from image compression. We rely on prior knowledge. So in order to model, as the dude tells me I have to model it, I use prediction, I use context based on quantized data, all sorts of ideas that come from, from prior knowledge on the fact that these are images. Okay? So currently, so the, the holy grail is to incorporate a safe amount of prior knowledge to reduce the richness of the class. So we are like semi-universal now. Now, currently, we have the, the state-of-the-art in salt and pepper noise removal, and we are competitive for Gaussian and real-world noise removal, but we are still working on that. So we are not the best of the world in Gaussian noise removal, but we are competing against schemes that were designed specifically for Gaussian noise, and that wor don't work for other types of noise. Here, we are taking a universal scheme and applying it to any type of noise. So I th uh, there is another application which I won't go through now. So let me go to one of the other two topics that we had, which is the application to nanotechnology and two-dimensional information theory. So two-dimensional constraint coding. So our group is working in the analysis and design of communication systems involving two-dimensional signals and channels. And one example of this, that one typical example, is two-dimensional constraint channels. And let me show you a figure that shows why this is important. Take the DVD standard. When you look at how data is encoded in DVDs, 
even though the medium itself is two-dimensional, the way the data is encoded is one-dimensional. You have these one-dimensional tracks with lots of separation between the tracks in order to avoid interference between them. So as the density starts to shrink, we will have eventually to go to two-dimensional, we'll have eventually have to go to two-dimensional types of, of, of coding in which you, took, you take advantage of the whole two-dimensional uh, structure of the problem. It's, it's suboptimal to reduce it to one-dimensional problems. So next generation system will seek to make use of, of this buffer storage space, which is wasted currently. Okay? So we'll have to deal with two-dimensional interference and constraints. So you'll see what, what first of all, I, I'll present briefly what constraint coding is and what is two-dimensional constraint coding. So channels will be inherently two-dimensional. So the thing is that currently, mostly in information theory, we take two-dimensional problems and, and you, we make them one-dimensional by scanning the data. So this is suboptimal in many applications. One application is storage. So our group is working on two types of problems, two-dimensional inter-symbol interference problems and two-dimensional constraint uh, channels. And this is work by Eric Cordentlich and Ronnie Roth, who is a uh, visiting faculty from the Technion. So he comes every summer and works with us in our group. So what are two-dimensional two constraint channels? So you will, you, what you, have, you want to do is to encode your data. You have data, and you have to encode in two-dimensional patterns, but having certain constraints. So for example, you don't, wa you don't want to have, in two dimensions, an isolated zero. Or you, don't, you cannot have an isolated one. So these are constraints that are well known in one dimension. But in two di to study that in two dimensions, there is an order of magnitude more complexity there in understanding the problem. I'm, I'm talking here about constraints that cannot be decomposed in one dimension. Okay? They are inherently two-dimensional. Another problem is what we call the DC free, so that it has to be balanced, that the number of zeros and ones in a row has to be the same, but also in every column. This is inherently, again, two-dimensional. You cannot design a one-dimensional DC-free constraint code and expect also to be in the, in the, colo in, in the columns also balanced uh, DC-free. So these are basically combinatorial problems. Okay? And we are working on that. This is fu futuristic in the sense, for HP is futuristic, in the sense that it's not yet clear when there will be storage devices which are inherently two-dimensional, what are the constraints that will be more, most relevant. Hopefully, when this comes, we will have patents on the relevant type of constraints. So at, so at this point, the research is focused on general tools. So what are the basic problems here? The basic problem is determining what we call the capacity of the channel. Basically, the capacity of the channel tells you how many different patterns you can encode. So the capacity is defined as the number of legal n by n arrays divided by n squared, which is what you could code if you didn't have to, uh, to uh, to satisfy any constraint, as n tends to infinity, this is what we call the capacity. So, and the idea is to find capacity and to find e efficient encoding and decoding algorithms which achieve, which achieve that capacity. So you are focused on low complexity and high rates. And uh, what the work we have right now is a work on a coding schemes that approach the two-dimensional, that th these are called two-dimensional approximate enumerative coding. And the idea is to approach the, ca the channel capacity 
for some DC-free and rank length limited constraints. And I have one minute, one, two minutes. So I won't go through the fourth topic, which is error correcting cost in nanotechnology, but just to satisfy the curiosity, if there is any, I will show you how, what is the relation between nanotechnology and error correcting codes. And the idea is that manufacturing perfect electronic circuits is expensive. So if feature size decreases, the cost of perfection may become prohibitive. And, at some, in, and, and this has nothing to do with achieving quantum phenomena. This is true even before you achieve the, the, the uh, quantum phenomena uh, that dominate the feature properties. So, but on one hand, you will need to, fu to function perfectly. You want your devices to function, but you have to be based on the fact that the components will be imperfect because it can be prohibitive to really, or impossible in some cases, to manufacture it without defects. And for example, in nanoelectronics, there, the problem is the interconnect between the outside world, the micro world, and the nanoscale resources. Okay? And here we will discuss application of error correcting codes to a design of default tolerant micro nano demultiplexers. And I will show you what is the problem. So the problem here is that we have nanoscale memories and we have microscale devices. So here the encoder. You have to address these memories which are nanoscale, and you do it with micro-scale micro electronics. Okay? So you need an interconnect, which is here, between the conventional wires and the nanowires. And this is this part here, this demultiplexer. Okay? And this is what we call a crossbar memory. So what we are going to describe sits here in this mixture between the micro scale and the nano scale. And this is work, this is com a collaboration between work in our group, in Gadiel Serussi, Ronnie Roth, Pascal von Tobel, and people in the quantum science research group, which are in our same lab, and that they work on nanotechnology. And we will look are two, I mean, we, I won't go through that, but we have looked at two types of the multiplexer, some which are diode-based, some which are resistor-based. Here, mainly, there is no, uh, we don't have any interesting uh, contribution in terms of coding theory. What we have here is a proof of concept showing how error correcting codes help. Whereas here, it turned out that the problem defined a new type of constraints in code, some com combinatorial type of constraints in code, which wasn't known before. So let me show you what basically the problem is here. So we are addressing this memory with micro scale um, electronics. So these are the zeros and ones that address the memory. And this, this um, Crossbar here ensures that only that if it works properly, that every time you address here, only one of the wires is actually activated. Okay? Now, what happens when one is cut? One of the diodes, the, the, the manufacturing was such that one of the diodes is not working properly, and you have a, 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 um, a cut. Here, well, it will, if, if you go through the basic electronics here, you will see that what will happen is that when you address, say, zero 01, which is the one that you would want to be activated, it will also, also activate the 11. One one. So, what, how you, do you do in order to, um, to avoid that? Well, the idea is to use redundancy, which is the same idea in our correcting codes. What you have 
what you want is to add here a parity check, for example, such that if you cut this parity check, when there is a 0, 1 here, the parity check will give you a 1, and, the, and you go through these electronics here, and you see that the 1 ensures, again, that only this wire is activated and not the others. So basically, what we have is to design an error correcting code. The difference with traditional error correcting codes is in that the, the difference with traditional error correcting codes is that your objective function is different. In an error correcting code, what you do, you add redundancy and you want to reduce the probability of error. Okay? But when you want to reduce the probability of error, you take into account that by adding redundancy, you, have you are sending more bits. So this, in itself, increases the probability of having an error. Overall, you have a coding gain. The typical, the, this is the, this, this buzzword used in communication. What is the coding gain that you get? Well, here you have a similar notion of a coding gain, but comes from a different thing. The coding gain comes from the fact that by adding redundancy, you have to pay more real estate. It costs you more in the amount of circuits you have to build. But on the other hand, you gain in redundancy, in, 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 in reliability. And there is a trade-off. Well, this trade-off can be discussed with the same tools that error correcting codes, and you have the notion of a coding gain. What is this coding gain is that well, if you don't compress, I think the encoded is this one. If you are encoded, of course, if you don't have any, any errors, then it, if it's encoded, it's best to leave it encoded. Why would you add redundancy if there are not going to be any errors? As the fraction of errors, the probability of error increases, then there is a coding gain that you see here. Oh, sorry. This coding gain here. It tells you that with this code, which is a 1274 Hamming code, that for the same fraction of open connections, okay, no, excuse me, for the same, excuse me, for the same addressable memory per unit of a, of a, for, per units, I mean normalized, for the same amount of memory, you can achieve a much lower fraction of open connections. Much lower, I mean much higher with this code than you would do if, you go, if it's uncoded. So this is what we call the coding gain. So I'm not going through the details here, I just wanted to use a few minutes to show what is the relation. And the, the point I, I'm going to show, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to stress here, is the collaboration with this quantum science research group that they, I mean, they found the problem and they realized that they had defects and they, they need redundancy. They didn't know much about coding theory, but the fact that they had coding theories available was, was I mean, solved the problem for them. Something that if HP wouldn't, or any company, wouldn't invest on having information the an information theory group, I mean, that wouldn't have happened. And that's, uh, I mean, this is just one example. There are very nice examples of how this interdisciplinary collaboration works. Okay. 